what I learned from that was the idea that there could be another way in life other than becoming ill and dying. Forever young, I want to be forever young. Before we jump into the interview with Natasha Vita Moore, I want to share a few quick updates. First, I've been doing interviews on Lifespan.io and Leaf's YouTube channel. I've interviewed Dr. Alex Zavarankov and Dr. Aubrey de Grey, and I have more interviews and other content coming up in partnership with Lifespan.io on their YouTube channel. So make sure you go there and subscribe, click the bell, and then select all notifications, just like you have hopefully already done this on my YouTube channel. This is really important for the YouTube algorithm so that we can get our longevity bio rejuvenation message out to a mass audience. Thank you so much for your support here. Also, I've created a new YouTube channel with other YouTube longevity rejuvenation enthusiasts, Rowan Horn, Max Anderson, and Alex Kotoff. We've already recorded a number of interviews with longevity thought leaders, and we'll be releasing them consistently over the coming weeks. This is really important also for the YouTube algorithm, consistency for content. So I'm trying to get smarter with the YouTube algorithms, and I hope that you will help us on our mission to do this as well too. Like, subscribe, comment, share, all those things are important. Natasha committed to do a part two on our YouTube longevity channel. So make sure you go there, subscribe, click the bell, and select all notifications so you don't miss part two with our longevity team. Also, we interviewed Richard Hart recently on a live stream on our YouTube channel, Longevity. Richard is a longtime longevity supporter and advocate. Richard was volunteering for SENS way back in 2006 and is a big, big supporter of Aubrey de Grey. Richard has created a new brand called SciVive. He's written a book with the same name. He has a Telegram group with over 1,500 members that's actively talking about longevity topics and he has a YouTube channel named SciVive. I hope you can subscribe, ring the bell, and select all, because we hope to do collaborations with them in the near future. Richard was a great guest. I hope you can check out that interview. The best thing you can do to support me is just subscribing to my YouTube channel, ringing the bell, and selecting all notifications. Another great way to support me is financial support. Please consider supporting me on Patreon. I have lots of different options that you can use for support. There's also a new service out called Pledsto, and I'm an early adapter here. This allows you to support me at a minimum of 10 cents a month. Who doesn't have 10 cents? Also, you can always check the description of all my YouTube videos where I have other ways to support me like cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, Litecoin, and then other fiat methods that are more traditional like PayPal, Venmo, and the Cash app. Also, consider following me on social media accounts like Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and others. I always have my social media accounts linked at the very beginning of all the descriptions in my YouTube channel. So please subscribe and ring the bell and select all on our longevity channel because we have incredible content coming up from live streams to long form interviews that are highly edited. Also some shorter content in the three to seven minute range for all you goldfish out there who don't have the attention span for one and a half, two hour in-depth conversations. Finally, I'm really excited to announce Longevity's mascot, Gene the Chromosome. Say hi, Gene. Hi, I'm Gene the Chromosome. Gene is pretty awesome, and we owe a lot of gratitude to Anya Yaki, who designed Gene the Chromosome with our longevity team. And Gene is going to help spice things up a little bit, and we're going to have a little fun and try and create more engagement. So what we're doing is we're going to have Gene come across my channel, hopefully Transhumania's channel, which is part of the YouTube longevity team. You'll see Gene on Eternal Life Fan, where we're always live streaming. Max Eternal Life's YouTube channel. You might even catch Gene on SciVive. And finally, we hope to also see Gene on Lifespan.io's YouTube channel. Now here's the game. Gene will be showing up for about five seconds or so in a random part of all of these videos, including this video right here with Natasha Vita Moore. 
So make sure that you're engaged and you're looking for Gene the chromosome because the first person who can spot Gene and then comment with the timestamp of Gene's location in this video will win a digital prize. The digital prize for this video will be a 30 minute free video conference with me. So be on the lookout for Gene and enjoy the interview with Natasha. Today's May 5th, 2020. I'm Brent Nally, and I'm really excited to have Dr. Natasha Vita Moore here today, who is the co-founder of the Global Transhumanist Movement and Executive Director of Humanity Plus Incorporated. Natasha is a professor of ethics and innovation and is one of the few in the longevity community to have a true scientific breakthrough by proving the long-term memory of C. elegans and cryonics. Natasha designed the first whole body prosthetic. Natasha is a scientific advisor to Lifespan.io and LEAF, and I'm now taking my YouTube interviews long form, just like this, and interviewing in partnership on Lifespan.io and Leaf's YouTube channel. So make sure you not only subscribe and click the bell to click all notifications on my YouTube channel, but please do this on Leaf's YouTube channel as well too. It really triggers the YouTube algorithms and helps us get this message out to a wider audience. So we gotta be smart in the way that we're getting this message out. Natasha uh, also, is on the steering committee of Coalition for Radical Life Extension. Natasha's research discusses the social and ethical issues resulting from emerging technologies of artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, and nanotechnology. In 1982, Natasha wrote the Transhuman Manifesto, which discussed the possibility for overcoming disease and extending lifespans, and later she founded an organization, the Transhumanist Arts and Culture, Natasha, welcome, welcome, welcome. It's so great to have you. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. When you hear that intro, do you kind of think, wow, who is this person? They've, they've accomplished quite a bit. Um, no, as, as a matter of fact, the opposite. I'm going, okay, I, I accomplished all that, but what am I doing now? And that I look forward to talking with you about. But it all seems to have a narrative um, like this this beautiful thread through it that's woven, taking my work from one level to another with that consistency and that continuity that I value very much. So while it's interesting to listen to, I think, what's next? All right, so in this interview, we're gonna talk about what's next. I did that intro for you because I thought it'd be more appropriate to do it kind of coming from the stars right now but I'm gonna turn off the Zoom background and come, <laughs> come back down to earth, okay? So here we are, I'm just in my office. So um, yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity to interview you and let's talk about what's, what's currently going on with Dr. Natasha Vita Moore and we'll also talk about what's next. Um, before we jump into that, can we maybe start with, you know, what created the Dr. Natasha Vita Moore that we are speaking to right now? How did you figure out a lot of these ideas and these concepts decades ago before most people ever thought about most of these things? And also, it's 2020 right now. Most people aren't even thinking about these ideas today. So what's, what's your story on how this all came about and how you got interested in these ideas? I think most of us are shaped by our childhood, how we were brought up, some of the experiences that we had, the positive things as well as the challenging things. I grew up in a family of five siblings, all extremely bright and highly creative. My father was an art director on Madison Avenue at Jung and Rubicon. And so we had that sensibility about design, um, advertising, um, how to look at products, and while my father certainly was not interested in life extension at that time or the future of humanity, he was very interested in the, not only the discipline of, of advertising on you know, Madison Avenue, um, Mad Men type, but also looking at Jackson Pollock and Kandinsky and some of the artists that were the abstract expressionists where you take your imagination beyond the canvas. And that's what Jackson Pollock did. He moved the boundaries of the canvas beyond the canvas out into life. And my father painted that on our dining room floor in one of our homes. And that always left an impression on me. A second element that was very important to me is my parents moved all of us 
from New York to a ranch in Ohio, well, like a farm ranch. And we had 88 acres. We had tree houses that we built with Morse code. We built a miniature golf course. We had fruit trees. We had a small little pond or big, big pond or small lake that we uh, would fish in and ice skate on. And, and we had vines that we played Tarzan. So I had that part of my upbringing too. So the Madison Avenue in New York with the museums in New York, the Whitney, the Guggenheim, the Metropolitan, all of that I grew up in as well as living out in the country on 88 acres where I learned how to really explore the environment and with my siblings have a great time. That was the foundation. There are other reasons that encouraged me to look beyond our human vulnerabilities. And I have to go to high school for that. When I was in high school, I was, um, very um, politically involved and involved in the community because that happened to be Memphis, Tennessee, where in my senior year in high school, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And I remember sneaking out in the middle of the night and um, forming groups to um, um, deal with this horror that we were facing about bias and discrimination. And that set a very strong instinct in my mind about the biases and and hegemony and anti this and anti that against a certain tribe of people. And being a woman, I felt part of that too. I was uh, prevented from really doing the things I wanted to do as a teenager because I was a woman. It was a man's world. And so that kind of helped me build my stamina for breaking through boundaries. Along with that, I did a lot of volunteer work and one such um, institution where I volunteered was the Home for Incurables, where people were so malformed that they were not allowed out in public. And it was difficult to do this work, but we took them um, party presents for the holidays, uh, some of the traditional holidays celebrated in that part of the United States, like Christmas and, and Easter and things like that, although I'm not religious, I certainly did go and take gifts and, and create um, family type circumstances and helping many different families in that community that had less than I did. Um, with a group of friends, we organized ways to take gifts and, and food and, and clothing to people in need. So that all formed my directive that helped create who I am. That in itself was a very strong foundation for me to want to be a humanitarian, for my desire to look beyond boundaries and look beyond the parameters of this canvas of which we're supposed to fit in and to take that to a societal perspective that is the canvas or the boundaries on what is normal or normalcy and certainly one of the strongest longevity issues there is that we are supposed to have a shelf life and live by that shelf life which is no longer than 122.3 years or some area there and then we're supposed to die that became my motto and my passion and there's certain narratives that led up to that, of course, but to answer your question, those are the fundamental elements of my upbringing and my experiences that helped make me um, kind of an explorer and to push the edge. <laughs> Very fascinating. And one thing that I've heard from a lot of rejuvenation experts that I've interviewed is compassion that's a key component of this movement that I think from the outside, people are not familiar with transhumanism or just radical longevity. They think initially it's, it's in, by the mainstream media, I see a lot of reports on narcissism. Oh, you know, billionaires just want to live longer and things like that. It's like, well, no, this is the human spirit spirit. You know, we want to live as long and healthy as we possibly can. The human story is always, you know, trying to do something better to improve ourselves. And to me, that's what transhumanism, humanity plus, rejuvenation technologies, whatever you want to define this movement as, that's the core of it to me, in my opinion. And so compassion seems to be a very important part from what I've heard from that story there. Is that, is that fair from your perspective? Yes, I think so. And I think that is a compassion as well as simply put, a love of life. Life is precious. 
every moment something could happen to us. And the fact that we're alive right now is not to be taken for granted. It is precious. And that fine thread of vulnerability between our human biology and our living longer is a tightrope walk. And we have to be balanced in all areas of our lives to be able to get to the other side, whether you want to call it some kind of life extension velocity lift or whatever you want to say about it. The thing is that to stay healthy and alive every moment as a directive is important rather than worrying about disease and death every moment. And it seems to me that most people are um, wearing an albatross of death around their shoulders and carrying that with them everywhere they go. If you listen to the, the conversations or the language, the vernacular of most people, it's always about, oh, I'm so old, or am I time's up, or you know, I'm too tired, I'm, I can't do that. All these negative myths and lore that we've been fed through the eons have really permeated into our culture today. And they still stand strong. So we need new myths, new stories, new narratives. And I think that's probably um, one area that helped me understand the, um, the sensibility of being um, one's own person and to be unique in that. I've always been very hard-nosed about not copying anyone, not um, repeating what someone else has done. I always want to be unique and find my own path. And I think that's probably <laughs> part of being a formally in my life, an artist. My undergraduate degree is in fine arts. I was a painter and performance artist. And I performed throughout the world in volcanoes, in the middle of oceans, in the Amazon jungle, different areas. And that's all about looking at the environment and well, let's say the ecology of life forms within the environment, which I've always been fascinated by. And something that struck a chord with me when I was in the art world is the, the myth of Vincent van Gogh. And the myth that I was trained and I never subscribed to, but was in, um, drilled into all designers and artists, and no matter if you're a writer, a filmmaker, actor, dancer, performer, still the same. That we were told we will not become acknowledged or successful until after we die. And if you think about that narrative, that story that was told to young students studying creativity and wanting to make a difference in the world, that you would never make money, that you would suffer, and that you would never have any form of recognition until after you die, like Vincent van Gogh or many other fine artists throughout time. That phrasing, that sentiment always severely <laughs> annoyed me, I must say, and annoyance it was. I would have to chuckle, laugh it a little bit, like how stupid, I mean, what? But right. I'm so glad that that myth no longer exists, that people can make a living through their own work and, and you know, we found new ways to, to re-establish that sentiment or that dictum, which it was. And um, so I, being an early feminist and, and radical thinker, thought, no, I'm not going to subscribe to that. And I remember my final year at, at undergrad school many years ago, um, instead of writing a thesis paper, I did a performance. And my performance had sculpture in it and visuals and video and a lot of different uh, modalities in it. it was multimedia, where I stood up and said no to that sentiment. And I still stand up to that that we don't have to die um, to be recognized. And I think that's pretty common sense today, and we all know that. But having grown up in a time when that was drilled into one's awareness, one's consciousness, is pretty damaging. Um, so I'm, I think that was the, the main drive that, no, I would defy that. And I would defy re religious um, proclivities as well. Because remember, in my upbringing, um, in the 50s and 60s, when I, in the 60s, how old was I? I mean, even in the 70s, uh, women were not at the, at the height of pretty much anything. Of course, there was Madame Curie, there was Joan of Arc, there was, you know, these names that we, that were tossed out in history books as being um, of consequential, maybe important. 
Uh, maybe they were necessary to default to naming a few women. But it's something that I've always noticed, and I still notice it today, when um, we talk about longevity, and, and it's largely men who are mentioned, I'm going, whoa, stand back. That's not right. Let's not do that. We talk about nanotechnology, and in all due respect to Eric Brexler, who I still consider the father of nanotechnology, there are women in this field, artificial intelligence, and certainly Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy deserve credit for having built out that field at MIT. There are women involved in that as well. And even in cybernetics, Norbert Weiner, who is known to be the, the, the core um, thinker beyond, behind cybernetics, in which we live in the, the cyberization with the internet, the internet of things, et cetera, there have always been women behind the scenes. And I don't want to see women behind the scenes in longevity or transhumanism. And I think that it's, it's our responsibility to stand up and say, wait a minute, let's get this straight and let's get this clear. Beautiful. Um, I loved all that. There are two major things that stuck out to me earlier when you were uh, chatting, other than the uh, women empowerment message which is that you are actually a zero to one person, not a one to one person. And what I mean by that is I have a number of books behind me that I talk about <laughs> on my YouTube channel quite a bit. And Peter Thiel, the uh, founder of PayPal and accomplished many other things, a uh, billionaire. He's also very interested in life extension technologies. He wrote a book in 2013 that I've read three times. I highly recommend it. It's called Zero to One. And it's all about creating new things, new technologies that don't exist. That's the only way we're going to advance forward for the human species. So you're a zero to one person. You said you don't like copying. That's the language that Peter Thiel uses. He likes to, you know, create new things. And the, the yeah. value can be incredible there. And then the Hold other- Hold on just a moment. Alexa, stop. Thank you. Your sure thing, no worries. We can edit Alexa that. Alexa always goes off at eleven thirty every day because that's when I go into my gym oh, and I okay. work out and I meditate. So, <laughs> no, no problem. Um, but I agree with you to zero to one, and it's something that, it's there's something about that sensibility, that find something new. Don't always copy what someone else is, does, or if you are going to borrow, give other people credit from where you got your information. And as you know, an instructor at a university for a number of years and being highly involved in academics, I'm always talking to my students about crediting where they got their information and making sure that when they talk about the new technologies that they're using, uh, that they find the thought leaders in those areas and they reference them and they know who who are the original thinkers, who are the current thinkers, and who's coming up with new ideas within their respective fields. That is so important because we can all take selfies and brag about how we're this or we're that, but it, it's weak. And I think people are starting to see through that. And we want more authenticity, sincerity, and as you say, more of a compassion. And the best way we can be compassionate towards others, especially in our fields of longevity, of technology, of life extension, um, and worldviews such as transhumanism, is to always be mindful and respectful of not only um, the pioneers, but also the, um, the new ideas, the new pioneers, the people who are coming up with new concepts. Very, very good. And the other idea that I heard there is you talked about the stories that were told to you as a young person and how they weren't, you know, the most uplifting stories. They were rather limiting and, dare I say, you know, depressing. So uh, another book I have behind me that I really <laughs> like is uh, uh, the book uh, Sapiens, where he talks about how what really separates humans from all the other species, including, uh, it appears, Neanderthals, is that uh, we tell stories and stories are really, really powerful. And the stories that we tell ourselves might actually be the most powerful, not the stories that we tell other people, you know, the stories going on in our own head. And oh, so I agree with you so much there. And it's not easy, especially during this, this time frame that we're in, where we're unsure about our economy. We're unsure about the, the political landscape. We're unsure about our own, you know, are we going to test positive or not? I mean, there's so much uncertainty around us that 
it's so important to to make sure that the stories going on in our own minds offer possibilities, opportunities, and, and self-love. Very important. Definitely. So now getting back a little bit to your story as uh, you were growing up and starting your career, can you share a little bit more details about how you know you became a leading transhumanist you know basically 40 years ago or, or even longer than that you wrote a book in 1982 which was currently 38 years ago i'd, I'd love to know that story how did this come about how was this individual Gosh. created <laughs> yeah it, it's so interesting a lot of it has to do with and this will tie in so here's my narrative um i lived in a beautiful mountain village for many years, and it's called Telluride, Colorado. And I owned a home there, and I built my first business there. I had a um, frame shop, and then I had a gallery, and then I had an advertising, um, no, I wouldn't say advertising, I had a commercial art uh, design business where I designed most of the brochures, the logos, the, you know, everything in Telluride, and um, a silk screening press. While I lived in Telluride, I was very happy. I didn't have a TV, I didn't watch the news. I had a horse um, that I rode daily. Um, I hiked through the mountains, uh, the mountains. We were so surrounded by 14,000 foot mountains on all sides. It's a ski town, a well-known ski resort, and it's also a film community where the uh, Telluride Film Festival runs every year. So I was pretty much secluded and happy and at the height of my life there. I, I loved camping out and hiking and riding the horse and, and running my businesses. I got involved with the film festival and through that I was the artist in residence at the film festival and I, I loved that too because most of the films shown at the Telluride Film Festival were European films. They weren't Hollywood films. And a lot of the independent filmmakers like Stan Brackage was there and um, Werner Herzog and Wim Wenders and um, Bertolucci and I mean, it was Coppola was there, of course Hollywood, but not quite Hollywood. And it was really great. So my, my peer group, my friends were not only the locals in Telluride who were skiers like me and small business owners, but individuals in the film industry and the music industry because we had the um, bluegrass festival, we had the jazz festival, so I had Herbie Hancock over for dinner and many individuals who are you know, very renowned in, in the arts and entertainment. And that was normal for me. My home became a center for um, the arts and entertainment. 1979, um, a man by the name of Richard Lowenberg came to Telluride from San Francisco, uh, from the Bio Arts Lab in San Francisco, and he got together with the Zolines, whose family owned the, um, the ski resort in Telluride, and they were friends of mine, and they asked me to be involved in something called Arts and Sciences 79. And when I became involved in that conference, I worked in helping to put it on, and I performed at it and, and did a number of different projects my mind changed because they or we had invited the leading technologists to present video, augmented reality, different virtual environments like Hole in Space, which was done by Kit Galloway and Sherry Rabinowitz, which was took place in Times Square in New York City, and then Century City in Los Angeles, where people could walk by through and say hi to each other using the West Star satellites. First time ever done. So the arts and entertainment went into satellites and virtual reality. And I went, huh? I woke up and I never went back. I, we sold our home in Telluride. I packed up my bags and I went to Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, I got involved in the film festival. I worked at Francis Ford, uh, Ford Coppola's uh, Zoetrope. I worked for 20th Century Fox. I wrote for The Hollywood Reporter. I made my own videos. I exhibited my own videos that I wrote, directed, and starred in, and they're all quite wonderful and fun. But that's not the point. The point is that during that time, I also decided to travel to Japan and performed there. And I was on stage every night um, doing, uh, I was um, an entertainer, let's say. 
and it was great and I enjoyed it and I enjoyed the, the fame and fortune of it. And I was invited to Paris, to the Paris Arts Festival. I was invited to Switzerland to perform with um, Peter Weiss, who was friends with David Bowie. And it was just a really wonderful time of being with the elitist artists in the world. I enjoyed that. Unfortunately, I got sick when I was in Japan and um, it changed my life. So here we have another pivot. And I think all of our lives, all of our narratives, our stories are based on circumstances that cause us to change or pivot from one direction to another. I was so ill, I was hospitalized in an intensive care for two weeks. I snuck out of the hospital. I was not released, I had enough. I left the hospital, <laughs> an aficionado picked me up in his Corvette American car, and um, I had to go back on stage. I did comedy. So I did, you know, I couldn't stand up. I was sitting down. I was ill with an ectopic pregnancy. My baby died and I almost died too. Um, I was looking so forward to having children as something that I've not been able to have, but it was um, a time in my life where I was at the top of my career as in the entertainment industry as a, an artist, not a fine artist, a performing. Um, visual, um, poetic type of artist. And most of my performances were, again, in the Amazon jungle, in spy volcanoes, out in the middle of the ocean. Um, and then um, uh, having soliloquies about life and death and, and the future. And that's always been the theme of my work. When I got back to uh, the United States, um, I remember I was living in Venice in the canals and I picked up a magazine. Uh, it was called the um, the Reader, and on the cover was someone by the name of F. M. Esfandiari, and I opened up the Reader, and I saw this article about this person who was just amazing. He was with the United Nations. He had he had um, participated in the Olympics. Um, he um, his father was an ambassador. Um, he taught at the New School of Social Research in New York City. He ran courses at UCLA. And it was all about the transhuman, the future human. And it was about life extension. And I don't think at that time he used transhuman. Let me, let me uh, rephrase that. It was about not dying and why we should live longer. And because he was not only with the United Nations and he was Olympic champion and an author of numerous books, Upwingers, Telespheres, Optimism One, The Beggar Identity Card, all books that had to do with the ideas that I already had about that canvas and to go off the edges of what is normal, to seek beyond, to be creative, to reach and explore beyond what you know is you know, given to us and told to us through our mythic lore, through rules and regulations, and through through um, what humans are supposed to be. And if you're outside of that, you're not normal, so you're the other. Well, F.M. Esfandiari's writings really intrigued me. So I went to the library, I got all of his books, and I read them. And then I called him up, and I introduced myself, and I said, I'd like to meet you. And we met, we became very dear friends, and that was in 1981. And we remained friends until um, he passed away. But what I learned from that was the idea that there could be another way in life other than becoming ill and dying. And well, in my own mind, I saw beyond that. I thought there's, you know, I, I'm the one who left the hospital when I was told not to leave. I thought, I'm not going to die here. <laughs> I'm going to get out of here and find a way to cure myself and get healthy. Did you feel like they weren't serving you properly in the hospital and you do better just getting out of there, it sounds like? Yeah, well, I, I, well they saved my life because I was down. I was found on the floor of a restaurant in, in, in a city in Japan um, hemorrhaging to death. And a woman who spoke English called an ambulance um, took me to the hospital, the doc, she translated with my English Japanese dictionary as I'm lying there in the operating room saying, you have to agree to the surgery or you will die. You've got like minutes, you know, you're dying. And I was delirious and I, you know, agreed because I trusted her and I didn't know what else to say because my mind was pretty much going. So, but I remember being on the operating table and they had to strap me down because I started, you know, 
freaking out. And I saw the knives coming at me. They had to cut me open and remove the fetus, which was growing outside my womb. And then that was all good. But in the recovery room, when I was in intensive care, there was a nurse that sat there at the foot of my bed and just stared at me all day. And then she left at night. And she didn't speak English, which was fine. And But no one... I was alone and um, in pain, and I would scream for morphine because I was in such pain. And of course, they gave me the morphine and everything, but they made me stay in bed. And I knew that the only way I could leave that hospital was to get up and start walking. So late at night, I would wake up. And when no one was around, I would push myself out of the bed and struggle holding onto chairs to try to get my feet to start walking. And then I would get to where I could walk down the hallways and then slip back into my room. They did not want to let me out of the hospital. They wanted to keep me there for a reasonable amount of time. In my mind, it wasn't reasonable. I wanted to get out of there. I knew that I, I was still you know, bandaged and you know, stitched up and everything, but I knew that if I didn't get out of there, I would, it wouldn't be good for me. So. I left. I snuck out. <laughs> no, they weren't doing anything wrong, but they weren't doing what was right. And what was right would have been to have people come visit me and talk to me to help me get to where I could move again, to get to where I could start walking again. And so um, that's what I knew needed to happen for my own um, physical health and my own mental health. I needed to be out of there. And so I left. Yeah, it's an empowering story where you have to think about what's best for you and only you know what's best for you. And that's something that I want people to consider right now in these interesting <laughs> yeah. times that we're in with COVID-19. So, okay, thanks for sharing more details there. Uh, please continue with, you know, the, the rest of your story that you were sharing. Yeah. So let's see. When I got back, I went to, when I left Japan, now, this is an interesting story, too. I was told to leave Japan. I was told to leave Japan because the Beatles were in Tokyo, and they were performing, but they were, had pot. And at that time, it was very illegal, very strict not to have any pot, any marijuana in Japan. And even though they weren't performing at the same location that I was performing, all American or non-American, any, let's say, people on a performance card, green card, whatever it was at the time, I can't remember, were told to leave the country. So we were sent out. And um, that was kind of sad because I still was not completely cured. I still had bandages on me, but, um, and I didn't want to leave. And, and my host didn't want me to leave either, but I had to. So rather than coming right back to the United States, being the creative person that I am, I'm always wanting a new adventure. I went to Maui. I thought, okay, I'll go to Maui. I'll chill out here and recover here until I'm well enough to go back to the mainland. But while I was in Maui, I wasn't feeling well. I, I, I wasn't, if something wasn't right. So I called someone, a friend in Telluride, and I said, hey, ask the town. Now, everyone knows each other there, and, and you know, I was a big fish in a little sea. So I said, send out an alert. Ask locals if they know anyone on the island of Maui that can help me. I need some help here. And it's hard for me to ask for help, but I knew I had to because I wasn't well. And I got a call back to my hotel room and it said go, and it just was a, an address. The person didn't have a telephone. So I got a taxi. <laughs> And I went to this home. It was right near the Hana jungle. And if you know Maui, it's beautiful mm -hmm. with banana trees and oh, it's gorgeous. So I went and I knocked on the door and um, it was a home of a filmmaker. Now remember Telluride was a film community. It was either a, a skiers community, athletes, or you were in the entertainment industry. In fact, Tom Cruise got married in, in um, Telluride. Uh, Oprah Winfrey would work out at the gym that I worked out in Telluride. So you have, and no one cares who celebrities. Um, Clint Eastwood would have breakfast with my nephew. I, you know, it's, it's just no one cared about any of that stuff. So forgive me for saying it, but I'm just setting this up for your audience because it, it is an interesting narrative. 
And I grew up with my father on Madison Avenue and, and I wore Raquel Welsh's bathing suits as, you know, at 12 years old. So celebrities don't matter to me. I think they're kind of silly to call them celebrities. I just see them as people that are highly creative. In any case, I went and knocked on this door and this gentleman answered the door and I said, hi. And I introduced myself. I said, I need help. I'm not well. And I've just been in Japan um, as an entertainer performing and um, can I talk to you? Can I stay here? And I ended up living there for three months. He was the most lovely person and he was a filmmaker. So we put our creative juices together and um, I was healing, um, walking better and moving around better. And then we decided to make a film inside the volcano Haleakala. And for any of your listeners that have been to Maui and know Haleakala, wow, it is one of the most beautiful sites on the planet. So we decided to make a film there and base it on my life story that I just gone through. Remember, I lost my baby and I felt dormant. I felt like a dormant woman. And Haleakala was supposed to be a dormant volcano. So we made a film inside the volcano with me dancing to the sunrise in this beautiful pink satin gown that I designed and I, I sewed. And um, first we walked through the volcano. We hiked, it's 33 miles long. So we had to spend the night in it. We went with a team of people and um, hiked through it down the sandy slopes out of the gap. And then at the gap, we walk out of the volcano, that's where Charles Lindbergh is buried. So it's really cool. So after doing that, we decided on um, the location to make the film. And the film is called Sleeping Goddess, Waking Muse. And the sleeping goddess would be the dormant volcano, the waking muse would be me. I don't wanna cry. Take your time. Overcoming that tragedy. So, um, but it's beautiful and I, I, it was shot in 16 millimeter and it's a tribute to the beauty of, of life in, in respect to death. So having done that, it was, it was just wonderful. I still have the images of those. He was also an incredible photographer and he did the most beautiful black and white um, images that I will have in my next book but it was such a, a beautiful way to end a tragedy that to have this ex exploration of hiking through that enormously incredible volcano. And um, it's called Madame Pelly's Path. And to have made that film in there, and I never you know, put it in film festivals. I didn't care. I don't care about that type of stuff. I'm not looking for awards for my work. My work is my work. It's my life. And um, I still have all of it. It, it has been put in some documentaries on, on my life. And I don't even know where the hell they are. <laughs> but I do have the images and perhaps I should get smart and start you know, documenting my work. But it was an incredible story. So after that, I went back to Los Angeles. And um, that's where we'll end up where I opened the magazine in Venice, California and the canals where I was living and I, I saw that picture of FM Espondiari on the cover and it just made sense. It's like I just went through this where I almost died and then I made a film inside a volcano that's dormant and now I want to come back to life. I, I survived that. So what is my next step? And then it hit me like a, 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 a bolt of lightning, life extension. Why should anyone die? Why should a baby die? Why should any human die? Why should anyone who, thinking of my years as a teenager at the Home for Incurables, where I was going and taking them gifts and, and meeting with people who were so deformed, they were not allowed out in public, which would be politically incorrect today, but that was in the 1960s. So we've come a long way over time, um, and we still have a long way to go. You mentioned the biases against longevity and how people think it's a selfish thing, think that you know we're narcissists, all this. I went through that in the 1990s. After I wrote the manifesto in 1983, uh, the Transhuman Manifesto, and it got sent out on board the Cassini-Huggins spacecraft in 1997, I think it was. And that was the first time the writing, I am a transhuman, and the idea of life extension and longevity and not dying was put out across our solar system. And that's something I've not even promoted either, but I think I should now that you're bringing it up. And I think that you're going to be um, a very valued friend to me um, because you're someone who 
reached out to me and here I'm sitting in my own little world um, doing my own little creative stuff and forgetting that that I do have a history and that um, I, I need to respect myself first and, and take care of that, which I will after, after this. I, I promise to do that. Um, but I, I have to say that it was FM Esfandiari that, that inspired me, but it wasn't an inspiration that came out of nowhere. I was already inspired by living through it by going and by how I was brought up at, in undergrad school as a fine artist being told I had to die before I could make money at my craft. So 1982, Natasha, you wrote the Transhuman Manifesto. And I mentioned that in the intro. Can you please share with us a little bit about what was going on in your mind and your life at the time, what that book is about? And then it, from your perspective, the impact that that book had on the life extension and transhumanist movement. When I wrote the Transhuman Manifesto, it was a poetic salvo about overcoming odds and looking for possibilities. And within those possibilities, it was looking beyond the vulnerability of the human body, the, um, our biological makeup, that has pretty much played a Russian roulette with our lives. The need to uh, look at the biotechnologies that were just surfacing. Uh, of course, we had ha already had the test tube baby in the 1970s, but looking beyond that, all the explorations and, exp and um, research done scientifically, and then the medical technological advances that were helping us better understand our own biology, not only through blood work, but through you know, x-rays and whatnot. And then as the advances in CT scans came about, that we were then able to look more deeply into our body. But it wasn't just the body. And in that manifesto, I also wrote that let us be more mindful and conscientious in our minds as well. That it's not just the body that we need to re-engineer um, to be ageless and to understand um, aging as a problem, if not a disease, but also to look at our minds. And I had seen so much discontent among people and so much pessimism amongst people, not as much as we've experienced today with social media, but it still it stood out then, especially with the Van Gogh story, um, that I thought that we must evolve, not only in our bodies, but also in our minds. And we still don't know what the mind is. We don't know what consciousness is. And anyone who says they do um, need to get a rain check on that uh, pontification. But we do know what the brain is. And we do understand and are beginning to understand more and more the neurological makeup that forms our cognition and the different um, psychological uh, theories of behaviorism and, you know, fundamentalism and, and you know, functionalism and um, all the different areas. But largely it's us. We know when we do right, we know when we do wrong. And the aim there is to always try to do good in the world. That influenced me more than anything, especially in the entertainment industry, where I saw so many people being there who were dropping names and, and trying to hobnob. And, um, People tried to hobnob with me, too, because they thought because I was from Telluride, it must be some rich chick. And um, I have many wealthy friends in the entertainment industry who are highly successful, but I was not one of them. And let's make no doubts about that. I was not. Um, and, but I didn't want to be in that way. And I made a decision that when I had the opportunity to um, become um, part of that tribe, I said no. And I remember a meeting with Volker Schlorndorf, who was a very dear friend at the time, and Bertolucci at the Chateau Marmont, where I had been staying. Um, they were talking about me going into films and acting in films, and, and I had studied acting for many years. And I said, wait a minute, I want to go into technology. I want to deal with the future of humanity. And I remember Volker Schlorndorf looked at me and said, why? Why are you interested in technology? Bertolucci said, ah, oh, that's something interesting there. But I did leave the Hollywood entertainment industry because no matter how many ideas I pitched about the future of humanity, 
technology, life extension, it was all frowned upon because it was more about the Terminator or the bad things that happen with AI and technology. And I was looking for the possibilities. So that was a, another turning point for me. I left the entertainment industry and I focused exclusively on future. And I went to every conference I could no matter where, whether it was Silicon Valley, which most of them were at, and I, I helped to put on some conferences through x Institute on nanotechnology, life extension, uh, biotechnology, genetic engineering, all sorts of therapies. Um, we were the first group to put on those conferences, and that was in the early 1990s. And um, x Institute deserves a lot of credit as far as being uh, a, an engine behind this current longevity movement what that we have, because in Silicon Valley and in the LA area in San Jose, we put on those conferences and we talked about biotechnology and life extension long before it ever became part of the mainstream um, um, vernacular, the mainstream um, language, our memetic engineering that we have today. But I have to give credit to a couple of other people there. There was Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw, who wrote books about vitamins and longevity back early on. And those two people are really heroes for us. And we must pay tribute to them. Not only Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw, who lived in Topanga Canyon, and I think they're still alive today, I don't know, but there's also was um, Dr. Roy Walford, who was um, a researcher, scientific research and gerontologist at UCLA who was working with mice and came up with the, the theory of calorie restriction, which many people practice today. I don't practice it, but um, it's a very interesting um, process in reducing calories for life extension. And Dr. Roy Walford should always be remembered and revered as an early purveyor of longevity. So there you have four people. Um, Dear Pearson, Sandy Shaw, uh, Roy Walford, F.M. Sfandiari, and they were early on. Of course, before then, we have um, um, Thineau out of France and um, Nikolai uh, Fedorov out of Russia, who talked about um, overcoming death. So it's it's been in our our history, and then of course the Taoists, and then the Egyptians. I mean, the the idea of longevity or overcoming death is nothing new. It's historically cemented in um, many of the the cultures throughout time. The issue today is we do now have certain therapies, technologies, medical interventions that are allowing us to turn back the clock. So in 1982, when I first got interested, 1981, 1982, in life extension, I set out very carefully to study the technologies, I'll go to the conferences and sit in the back, not make myself known, but to listen and study and research. And then I, and that was in the 1980s. Um, by the light, late 1980s, I hosted and produced a television show in Los Angeles called Transcentury Update. And I had uh, many guests talking about these technologies, AI, robotics, automation, clean energy, a photovoltaic systems, electric cars, cryonics. And um, so I was one of the first people to ever have a TV show on longevity. Um, second thing is I ran for, um, uh, in the 1991, I ran on a transhumanist ticket for the Green Party and was elected uh, in Los Angeles by a landslide. I was actually on a ticket. It was a very authentic legal um, campaign and my campaign was based on transhumanist technologies to clean up the environment, which I still support 100%, looking at nanotechnology to eat up you know, the oil spills and help maybe with the ozone and, and to clean up our environment. So whether it's nanotechnology or a different technology, it's something I highly support. So I was elected by a landslide. I served on the Green Party for a year, a year and a half, and then I resigned. There was too much inner fighting, and that's something I don't like about political parties, the fighting. And he said, she said, they said, and this, this I think it divides people rather than brings people together. And I see that today with the different transhumanist parties. I see this divisionism 
Um, it's like the socialists hate the libertarians, the techno progressives don't like this. I'm a member of all of the different groups and I appreciate all of them. And what I'm looking for is solutions to problems rather than pushing political party lines. And so through the 1980s with my TV show on, on uh, Grand Century Update, it was about the future of humanity. And then the early 1990s when I got politically involved and I don't regret it. But, uh, yeah, it was okay. But then I got involved with a transhumanist group that I think we must pay tribute to. And those that was the Extropy Institute. Extropy Institute was run by uh, Max Moore, who is actually, um, he wrote the modern philosophy of transhumanism. And he wrote it solo. He did not know Pierre de Chardin. He did not know Julian Huxley. He had not even read their works. So there's a little bit of confusion there about the history of transhumanism. So I'd like to clear that up. Julian Huxley wrote a chapter called Transhumanism in the book, New Bottles for New Wine. And he also had an, um, an, a lecture that he gave in 1951 on the future human. That book, New Bottles for New Wine, was written in 1957. So he did use the term transhumanism. But Huxley, um, my dog is named Huxley after Julian Huxley. He just <laughs> looked up at me from over there. But Huxley was an evolutionary biologist. He was not a philosopher. He was more of a theoretician. And like we could all call ourselves philosophers. But to have the study, the knowledge, the expertise in the field of philosophy is not easy. It's hard work. You have to study Hume and, and Voltaire and, and you have to study <laughs> Kantianism and all sorts of moral theories. It's a very in-depth field. And I taught it um, briefly, but I wouldn't claim to be an extremely knowledgeable person about philosophy. I just taught ethics. But Huxley, Julian Huxley did something amazing, which I highly respect. As an evolutionary biologist, he thought beyond um, the, the, the canvas, those edges. And he thought that there could be a way that people could reinvent themselves to transform. But he said, he wrote, man remaining man. He did not see a transhuman as an evolutionary process where we would overcome our human, our man. And as a feminist, and I think Donna Haraway, who wrote the Cyborg Manifesto, would probably agree, man a man remaining man is a very narrow perspective. Had he have said human remaining human, I would have liked that a little bit better. But then we have to look at the time frame in which that was written, which was 1950s, and women didn't really have much of a voice. So most of the language back then was about man rather than human or people. So Huxley is a very important name to remember, but here's some insight on this. And I did the research on it, and um, the research uh, my mother and I did actually together um, on the beginnings of the ideas of transhumanism. Where did the term come from? Did anyone actually coin it? And it has been written that Huxley coined the, the term transhumanism, but I challenge that. And I challenge that as an academic because I've looked and researched back to where the, um, that was derived from most likely. Alighieri Dante wrote about transhumanar, which means transhuman or transhumanism in Italian in his, in, you know, in his early writings. And um, that if you know, your audience can review that, and I'll, I'll put that in. It's already in uh, my book, this one here, Transhumanism, What Isn't. And it's also in my book over here, which <laughs> is The Transhumanist Reader. So if you want to learn about that, they're there. Um, I, as far back as I could check, it's Alighieri Dante in Italy some hundreds of years ago who wrote about a transhuman as a transformation. Then it was T.S. Eliot in the Pulitzer Prize winning play, The Cocktail Party, who wrote about being transhumanized, meaning transform. And his concept through The Cocktail Party is more about the psychology of transformation, that we need to get beyond these foibles, these, these cognitive, psychological um, narratives that keep us limited in our mindfulness. And of course, there's Pierre de Chardin, who wrote about transformation, and so many others. 
So I want to not disrespect Huxley. I respect his work highly, and I have his books, and I do read them. But he was a humanist. A man remaining man is a humanist um, ideology. And while it's a secular viewpoint, it still is um, focusing on maybe transforming certain elements of being human, but staying biological human. And that means that we would die. So he wasn't really that interested in longevity or life extension. Whereas the modern philosophy or the real philosophy of transhumanism written as a philosophy has to go to uh, Max Moore uh, when he wrote it in 1990, somewhere around that time. And as a philosopher, he um, has his philosophy degree from Oxford University and his PhD from USC and where he continued the concept of continuity of identity. And I think that's really important now that when we think about being the same person over time, no matter how much we engineer our bodies or how much we pivot in our own evolution, our psychological adventures in it and experiences, that we maintain that continuity of identity of who we are. Now, who I am now is not the same child in New York City in the museums or on the ranch, the farm, um, in Ohio, or the teenager in Memphis fighting for human rights, or the, the woman who traveled around the world performing, or the person who got out of the entertainment industry in Los Angeles because of my interest in, in uh, life extension. I am every one of those people who made me who I am today, and I hope the lessons that I'm learning today make me a better person tomorrow, but I just wanted that to be really clear because it gets obfuscated, especially within the political arenas that we have today. Transhumanism is not about politics. It's about human potential. And you said it earlier, it's that, that ability to be loving, maybe empathic, to be caring, to, to break through some of the negative interpretations of the transhumanist agenda is extremely important. So politicizing it could be very damaging because politics don't really care about the, the soft, fuzzy life of humans and our society and embracing our differences. Politics, uh, political parties are manufactured to evidence and show differences so they win. It's a win-lose. It's a zero-sum game, basically. Right, yeah, and I try to stay away from zero-sum games and try to focus on positive-sum games in life. And, you know, I, I'm full of quotes. I do some impersonations as well, too. So the famous, <laughs> uh, the late Ross Perot was famous for his quote, and I'll try and do a little Ross Perot. War has rules. Mud wrestling has rules. Politics has no rules. And I think we're seeing that play out right now in the crazy times um, that we're currently in. But at the same time, we have to live in reality and, and politics are a reality of our situation. So I, I do try to support the United States uh, Transhumanist Party that Gennady Stilarov is currently the chairman of and that Zoltan Itzvan founded, I believe in 2015 or 2014. But I've interviewed Zoltan. And I think that it's important, but it's not what I personally spend much of my time on for many of the reasons that you stated uh, so eloquently, I do agree with very strongly. The more you're talking, the more I'm realizing that we have a lot in common. I agree with the former wrestler and governor of Minnesota, Jesse Ventura, who says that you know the Democrats and the Re and the Republicans are more like the Democrips and the Rebloodlicans. You know, <laughs> they're basically gangs. And it sounds funny at first if you haven't heard that. He wrote a book called Democrips and Rebloodlicans a few years ago. But if you actually get past the humor and you look into the facts. In my opinion, these political parties are doing insanely high, higher damage than any two little gangs are doing, you know, basically in inner city Los Angeles and Chicago is where the Crips and the blood, Bloods are, if you think about the damage that they're doing to our society, in my opinion. So I don't associate with either of those parties. And um, so, yeah, I, I, uh, there's, there's so much to, to talk about from your incredible life and your story that you've been sharing with us so eloquently regarding Aldous Huxley. You know, I can't help but think about the times that we're in right now with COVID-19 yeah. 
and the things that are happening, the liberties and freedoms that people are just so, you know, easily giving up, not only in America, but other places. And I want people to think about, you know, I've read Brave New World, I've read 1984 and other dystopian books, you know, by uh, Aldous Huxley and George Orwell. These were not supposed to be a manuscript for the future. They were supposed to be a dire warning of the world that we could turn into. Uh, they were not supposed to be a playbook. They were not supposed to be a playbook. playbook. And if you actually go back and read those books now, we're already past some of the things that were dystopic predicted in those books in the form of surveillance and control by big governments. So we don't have to, you know, I want to interview you and I want to talk about what you want to talk about, but I do want people to think about that and maybe go and read those books and think about uh, what's going on right now in this world. I agree with you. If, if there's any silver lining in this, in this tragic environment that we have landed in, it is that finally people realize the vulnerability of our biology and that we have each to take on self-responsibility to protect ourselves. And that person who's coming within your, <laughs> coming closer than six feet that doesn't have a mask on that's coughing, don't get angry, don't cuss them out, just move away. And I find myself doing that when I wear my mask when I, when I go at places I, I must go. Um, and um, I keep a hand sanitizer in my car and um, I, I'm very careful not to come in the vicinity of someone else. I do practice that six to 10 feet uh, degrees of separation, but it's my responsibility to wear that mask. Now I know I was tested and I don't have it. Um, and soon I'll be tested to see if I have the antibiotic for it. But just because I was tested two days ago and I got the results back yesterday that I do not have it, I could get it tomorrow. And so it's, what do we do about that? So. It's going to become a way of life. There's a few points I want to make on this. Number one, it's a disappointment. Number two, it's my next project. Number one, <laughs> bad news first. My disappointment is that there's no great designer like Tom Ford or Donatella Versace or Donna Karen or any of the, the wonderful designers that we have that have plenty of access to the tools, the manufacturing, and the uh, keen insights and, and talent have not come up with a wearable, a face and gloves that come to here that we just slip on, that could be maybe transparent, maybe um, would have to have, you know, you know the, the breathing apparatus and, and protection, but, and the eyes are important because the germs can get, the virus can get in through the eyes, but to at least have something we can all slip on before we go outside. So we don't have to wear these masks that are really uncomfortable, but something that's extremely lightweight, um, that would be transparent or opaque, whatever we choose, that would be a cool looking design, kind of like a hoodie, you know, maybe something hip, and make it so that they're mass produced for everyone to wear, that we just all wear them. I mean, it just, it's, it's common sense to me. So I'm there, I know that there are a lot of companies that have donated their time and efforts and, and, and um, resources to creating masks. I wanna see something that's gonna cover me fully in my hands. And that when you walk back into your home or your car, whatever, there is some kind of a device that just purifies it, you know? You just walk through and purifies it. We have a purifier for our knives in our kitchen. We put our knives in there, we turn it on, we plug it in, it purifies our knives. So this is what I see that, that ought to be happening. And bless the hearts of everyone who has already been doing on the front lines, doing everything they're doing and they're getting applause. And, and I think most of us are probably getting tired of the word together, but <laughs> we're in this together. Yeah, we know that we got that memo. <laughs> so now that's my disappointment that no one, no great, artistic designer has come up with this yet. Um, my next project is something that I found the silver lining in, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's I've been working on it for the past couple of weeks. Uh, when I designed um, the whole body prosthetic in 1997, it was extremely successful. It was on the cover of magazines throughout the world. I mean, even countries I've never heard of were calling me and interviewing me about it because it was a whole body prosthetic designed with the latest technologies, but it was an idea before its time. 
I have been reworking on that, that concept and um, I'm looking at it for real. So it'll be my body and it's going to show all the different current scientific advances and techno medical technological breakthroughs that we have today that are re-engineering our bodies and our, our minds. So with the brain, we have the, the problem of you know, certain cognitive issues with ADHD, ADD, um, mental illnesses, schizophrenia, psychosis, um, and then there's dementia and Alzheimer's. What is being uh, worked on in those areas? And then as far as our, our skin, which is our largest organ, what therapies are being developed that we can use safely for our skin to reduce the effects of aging with our DNA, with our genes, what genetic therapies are tested, are safe for us to use and available, what ones are, are being researched today. So there's a lot being said about stem cells, but not all stem cells actually provide the resolve or result that we're hoping for. Sometimes they can go astray and people need to be informed about this. So I'm looking at the whole body prosthetic as not just something that was already done, it's something that's being redirected, re-steered towards current day applications and um, knowledge. So it's going to serve as an educational tool, but it's also gonna serve as a visual uh, design wise tool to uh, reintroduce concepts that have maybe um, been talked about, but not proven and I think I want to offer a reliable uh, resource in that regard. So I'm, I'm very excited about that project. So two things that I heard there, Natasha, is first of all, that a, good, a crisis is always an opportunity for us to improve. And, you know, with this COVID-19 crisis, we should create new technologies. The inventors, the scientists, the entrepreneurs of the world need to really come together and we need to fix a lot of the problems that we've quite frankly known about for decades and been complacent about. So for example, if we do the things that you mentioned and create these technologies to stop COVID-19 or, you know, like the mask and the face mask you're talking about, we can also at the same time dramatically minimize or reduce or completely remove things like influenza, which according to the World Health Organization and other uh, credible entities, kill on average about 460, excuse me, 646,000 people every year globally, annually. We just are complacent on this though, right? And rhinovirus and other coronaviruses that just wipe out people, but we just think that that's normal. Well, that doesn't have to be normal. That's the whole transhumanist message is that we can improve, we should improve. This is something that we should strive to by using science and technology to improve life. And another thing that I heard you mentioned uh, was about you know, aging. And uh, if you look at COVID-19, Leaf and Lifespan.io have mentioned that aging is the foremost risk factor for COVID-19. And I think that that's a brilliant message that is getting communicated somewhat throughout the mainstream media and governments now, as we sit here on May 5th, a little better. But this is something that I personally figured out in January when I did my initial research on COVID-19. I said, oh, this is just clearly wiping out you know, people of higher age way more. The morbidity and mortality rates are insanely higher. Uh, they go up dramatically after age 40 and then just keep rising. So um, let's talk about your scientific advisory role with LEAF and Lifespan.io and maybe the things that I just mentioned there, how that ties in. I think it's very important that we consider what transpired in Japan about five years ago. And I'll preface this very concisely for you. I was invited to give a keynote on an issue Japan was facing. And I didn't realize it was probably trending around the world, but now I see that it is. Back then, though some years ago, I was asked to address the issue that they were facing. People retiring early. I think their retirement age was something like 59. And a reduction in birth rates. So much so that they were facing a population decline. The concern at the university where I was lecturing was that the older generation, the people say 60 and over were not being 
held at the same regard they had been historically, given the respect for wisdom, what they could offer to the community because of the, the other generations, the millennials down to the X and the Y generations, didn't see them as necessary, largely due to social media and their lack of ability to participate on that scale. So now let me move this forward. I came up with an idea called the regenerative generation, where I pitched the idea that those seeking retirement, whatever country, whatever age that is, be also re-included in lifelong learning re-education, that there be events, formats, facilities available to these people so they could learn new skills, whether it's social media skills, how to text, how to tweet, whatever it is, as a way to contribute to the economy. Not only would that contribute to the economy, it would also make that particular tribe of people over 60, 70, 80, 90, meaningful, purposeful, and worthwhile to society. Therefore, they wouldn't be disregarded to look down at because they weren't participating in society. I think that's where we stand now. And I think this is something LEAF could really contribute to. Aging is a disease, we know this. The fact that people 60, 70, and on up are in the, the um, dangerous area for getting COVID-19 and surviving it is alarming. The fact that more and more nursing homes are reporting deaths, if not increased cases, is alarming and sad because these are our precious citizens of the world. These are people who have life experiences, who have knowledge that need to be shared. So if we could look at this generation as a regenerative generation of people that can relearn, be welcomed back into society, that would be wonderful. It's the wisdom of people who have lived a life, no matter how wealthy, how poor, how informed or educated or not, it doesn't matter. Everyone's experience, their own personal experience, their own story, as you said earlier, is important. So let's hear these stories. We need to bring them back in. We need to give them positions and jobs and to feel needed and wanted and part of society. I think that's something that COVID-19 can address by having some precedent, some, it wouldn't be a policy or legislation, it'd be more of a, a memo or a report on what is needed because those people are running scared right now. And I'm part of that group, I'm 70, so I'm considered a has-been. I was let go of my job because I'm 70. I'm looked at as a has-been, especially in many communities because I'm 70 and I say, no way, I will fight for this and I'll fight good and hard, that I'm youthful, I'm vital, and I still have a lot of life worth living. My brain is still highly active. I work out and lift weights, and I consider myself a sexual, sensual, a sensual woman. So I'm not alone in that. Age is our number, and it should not dictate who we are. But when we get into something like COVID-19, Chronological age does mean something because our bodies start deteriorating, some maybe earlier than others. Well, I've met people in their 40s and 50s that appear and act older than someone in their 70s and 80s. That is frightening to me, and it just goes to show that chronological age does not determine who we are in our life. But it is consequential when we think about the deterioration of the body and the disease of aging. And the most vulnerable people are those who have immune deficiency disorders. But you don't have to be old to have that. It's just part of the aging process. And if that's part of the aging process, it is a disease. So our immune system having problems or being deficient is a disease. And I think that LEAF can be one of the pioneers and the purveyors of bringing this to the attention, not only of uh, in the United States, but because LEAF is a global organization, it should make this a precedent for everyone everywhere to understand this. Very beautifully said. Mm -hmm. And regarding aging being a disease, I just want to give myself a quick plug. I've written a couple articles in the new digital magazine called The Immortalist Magazine, founded by Denora Delphin, who is a wonderful human being. And in my first article, which was I Am Issues number three in March, I talk about the difference between chronological 
and biological aging and how they're intertwined as well too. They're related, but they're different. And we don't yet have the best technologies to measure biological aging. I think the best technologies that we have that are agreed upon uh, from the rejuvenation experts that I've interviewed are the Steve Horvath DNA methylation clock, who is, Steve Horvath is a professor at UCLA. It's a very good predictor of when you will die, your mortality. And there's many other biomarkers as well too though, you know, telomere length, but that's the testing isn't, you know, great on that. It's just measuring the white blood cells of your telomeres. We need to know the telomere length of yeah. all of the, you know, 50 trillion cells in your body and the different cells, you know, your liver cells are different from your brain cells and all sorts of other things. There's, there's over 300 um, bio testers that we can do for your, for your biological age. Uh, so there's that component but then there's the other component of disease. You know, Dr. Aubrey de Grey calls aging a medical condition or problem. You call it a, a disease. I personally call it more of a disease as well, too, because I don't think a, a medical condition or problem is strong enough language, in my personal opinion. I, I want the world to see this as a disease because aging is currently killing about 110,000 people on average per day out of about 150,000 people on average per day that die globally. It's clearly the biggest problem in the world if one defines a problem as killing humans. And I certainly define that as a problem. And Natasha, as you so eloquently stated just a few moments ago, not just killing humans, but killing the people who have the most wisdom, the most experience, skills. And I think this is very well uh, misunderstood and I think it's misunderstood because throughout all of human history, we haven't been able to do much about it. So we've created these stories, you know, in our culture, whether it be religious or whatever, to say, well, aging's it's natural. There's nothing you can do about it. Just go on with your life. Don't worry about that. And we create these stories that it's good and things like that. But it's not good. And we want to fight it. And we want to use science to fight it. Um, and another thing that you mentioned before, you talked about uh, learning, lifelong learning. I don't know if you know this about me, but I, I quit my last job at LinkedIn, which is owned by Microsoft. I was selling e-learning. LinkedIn's product is LinkedIn Learning. And we got, LinkedIn got uh, acquired by Microsoft, as I mentioned. But before that, I was at lynda.com and they got acquired by LinkedIn. Lynda.com was an e-learning company founded by Linda Wyman in 1995. So e-learning is incredibly important to me. And there's lots of great opportunities online with Udacity and Udemy and LinkedIn Learning and many, many others. I just saw that Harvard might actually be offer, offering all of their courses online for the fall semester of 2020. I just saw that a few days ago. So our world is changing in many ways. And I think that COVID-19 is going to bring us into the digital age faster, which I, for one, am welcoming. I'm already have my whole life set up digitally. I'm on Zoom, I'm on Skype all the time, building businesses and, you know, interviewing fantastic people like yourself about rejuvenation technologies. I don't have to go in my car and emit a bunch of uh, CO2 and, and waste time, money and energy doing those things. That's kind of the old world. If I want to, I can but the environment has already cleaned up dramatically uh, in the last couple months since COVID-19 has happened. This has been very well documented. The uh, air quality in Los Angeles and places in China is the cleanest on record since we started testing now. So um, I just kind of threw out a bunch of things there. I'm piggybacking on a lot of the ideas that you mentioned. So what are your thoughts on some of those things I just mentioned? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. It, it's absolutely fascinating. And what was coming to mind as you were speaking uh, is that that old uh, dictum, the old should die and make way for the young. <laughs> How many times have we heard that growing up? And it's just like, the old should die and make way for the young? I mean, as if there's not enough room for everyone. So I think that, um, I think that, if, I think that once we see the senior generation come up with a new name for themselves, and maybe you can come up with a new name, or I call it the regenerative generation, but that's a little bit lengthy and wordy, but senior citizen is just, 
no one wants to get that letter from AARP when you turn, what, 55? <laughs> right, it now shows how outdated, citizen. you know, the whole, uh, yeah. No, I, I don't think anyone really wants to receive that. It, it, um, I think that that whole concept of senior citizen, you're not treated like a senior citizen, you're given maybe um, a reduction in tickets to the movie theater, you know, Senior Citizens Day, it's all very embarrassing and there's nothing sexy or sensual to it. There, um, it's, it's like you're a has-been now, okay, now go away. But some of the beautiful things though I have observed, to be fair here, some of the ads on TV um, about Viagra or vaginal rejuvenation are really great because they're showing romance after 60, after 50, after 60, after 70. And I think that's really great that that industry has um, not shied away from advertising on television. So that's good. Um, but I, I think that we need a new name for the senior citizens. And, and there certainly needs to be a new style. Um, lifelong learning, um, edX. I, I met the, the head of Harvard when I was in Seoul, Korea at the Global Leaders Forum where I was speaking. Um, so it was um, the head of the um, Education X from Harvard as well as ASU, and we had a great talk about the future of education, and um, it needs to be available 24/7 online anytime. So uh, thank you for for mentioning that. Very important. Um, I think one area that is missing for most conversations is authenticity and reliability. Uh, there's so many new companies, there's so many new projects, there's so many um, new uh, ways to solve um, some of the, the issues with aging. And I think that we, we really need to employ critical thinking far more than we already do. We're hopeful, we want them to work. You know, it's, it's like, yes, please do it, please do it. But at the same time, we need to be patient and wise. Um, when you have an illness, not every new gene therapy or um, biotech is going to work for you. you. Need to pay attention to what your body's doing and what your diet is and your life practice. And that goes back to self responsibility. What we found out over the past few years is more and more of the diseases that we have are based in the gut because our diet's wrong or we don't have enough. Um, probiotics. But if you take probiotics and you've got bad gut stuff, <laughs> it's going to feed the bad stuff. So you need to take the prebiotics first to clean out the bad stuff and then take the probiotics. But people are saying, oh, prebiotics, probiotics. It, we really need better sensibility about this. And as far as biotechnologies and stem cells, they don't always work for everyone. And you may have a knee injury and get a stem cell to help um, build ligaments and tendons and you know the elasticity there it may not work for someone else. So I think what we need more than ever is personalized medicine. You did mention biomarkers. I remember in um, 2000, I went to Kronos here in Scottsdale, which was the first biomarker uh, life extension um, um, medical unit. And I went in as one of their zero patients for it with a small group of people. And we had all the testing done for our biomarkers, um, you know, bone density, DEX scans, um, uh, heart rate, um, everything possible done to test us. Um, not quite what we have today, which is far more advanced, but it was the most advanced. It was um, run by Chris Heward, who was the, the endocrinologist, the chief scientist there, and it was financed by the founder of the um, University of, what is it, University of Phoenix? Is that what it's called? University of Phoenix. That's the online university. Yeah, the online, yeah. So John, I can't even remember John's last name, but um, he put up the money for it. It was called Kronos, K-R-O-N-O-S, and I found out everything about my body. And it was really fascinating. I still have it. It was a big, thick book given to me that had a breakdown of every single aspect of, of myself. Well, interestingly enough, I haven't found a biomarker um, group that I, I really have wanted to go to since then. But about three, four months ago, I had my hair follicles tested to, to test what was going on in my body. So my hair was pulled out and sent to a lab in Germany. And they tested to see 
um, what was going on in my body. And the, your hair follicle will, will um, have a time frame of 90 days, so it will report. So I got um, another booklet, not as thick as the Cronus one, but another booklet back on my body, what everything was going on in my body. And it was very interesting to see what my diet was doing, uh, what deficiencies I had, where I was um, excelling, and um, whatnot. But our best test is our own life. Do you wake up happy? Are you getting enough sleep? How does your stomach feel after you eat? Um, what is your stamina? What is your attitude? And from every uh, person who has ever lived a very long and healthy life, they say, oh, I smoke cigarettes or I drank my whiskey. That is almost inconsequential. What has been far more consequential is the attitude. I keep on moving, keep on exercising, and have a positive attitude. And it's hard to do, especially now, I know, but um, it's worth taking the time to practice it. And I think that is what I call my, my key to ageless thinking. I cannot agree enough, Natasha. I have studied longevity extensively and centenarians and super centenarians. Centenarians, of course, are people who live to 100. Centenarians, uh, super centenarians are people who live to 110, which are insanely small amount of people, like 0.0001%. And there's so much data that we now have on these people, and it's incredible data. But the one thing that has been overlooked by data scientists, people studying them uh, quite a bit, is just actually spending time with these people, getting to know them, asking them questions rather than, you know, plucking and prying at them and getting blood samples and telomere lengths. All those things are important, you know, that's, that's science. But if you actually get to know these people and start talking with them, you'll find that what you said is exactly true. These people um, are very positive in general, the people who have lived to 100 and plus. And the difference is they're not just positive, you have to understand how and why they're positive. They do not let negative life events get them down for a long period of time is the key thing that I've found. So in other words, you know, if they lose a loved one and they mourn like most people do, but they mourn for a appropriate and short amount of time and then they get on with their life. They don't let those negative emotions become them and consume them because we know about the placebo effect and that's very important. But I think that what's not publicized is the nocebo effect, which is the opposite of the placebo effect. It's just as powerful. The placebo effect is essentially positive thought, thoughts affecting your biology in a positive way, helping you potentially heal and overcome diseases and conditions. Whereas the nocebo effect is you just causing your own diseases and problems essentially. And we have interesting data on the nocebo effect as well too, with elderly people who are married one person dies and we have dramatic higher percentage of the spouse dying in a short period of time. Now there's, there's other reasons to explain this, right? There, if you're married and you're together for many times, there could be things like, oh, like I, I'm disabled and my wife or husband was actually helping me do certain things that I can't physically do anymore. But I've looked into that data extensively and it's actually more than that. The nocebo effect tends to be the most powerful thing here. So I cannot stress enough to my audience how just keeping a positive mindset, auditing your own thoughts is, is so important. And so I really want the audience to consider what you stated there. And the other things that you stated are about personalized medicine. I talk about that all the time on my YouTube channel. And I'm not sure if you're familiar. I pulled it up. I have the app. There's a there's an, a company called Viome, V-I-O-M-E, uh, founded by Naveen Jain. And I have my food recommendations here for my biome. I've been eating my biome diet for about the last 13 months. I, my wife and I did it in May of 2013 and I took a test here to, uh, to um, <laughs> I'm trying to, yeah, the phone took the filter off or it took the, uh, I think it's a little better. But uh, I've been eating my microbiome diet based off biome for about the last year. And I personally think that it's helping, but it's an emerging science. So are you aware of uh, Viome and, and what else can you share about the microbiome in general? Well, I think it's really important to know our, our biome and our larger biome, our bi microbiome that we take with us where we go, our whole stuff, you know, all the 
the elements, you know, that even cling to our hair or our hands or that we walk around with our biome. Um, so I think that ties into the, uh, you know, looking at um, what we're eating and our hair follicle and finding out what we're missing or what we've got. But to have that app is great. Um, apps are wonderful. The app for our psychology to um, help us with any negative thoughts we have, to remind us to um, find solutions rather than dwell on problems. Maybe apps to remind us to exercise like I schedule Alexa to remind me at 1130 every day to go into my gym to um, lift weights and, and uh, stretch and meditate. Um, also for drinking, you know, if you have an issue with alcohol or any, anything else that um, maybe you have a dependency for to, to get an app to help you with that is, is very wise. Um, so these apps are great. They really help us. Online groups that will help us if we're, we're sad about something. I usually keep, you know, to myself about that. I maybe have a couple of close friends that I talk to. Um, but I think that all this is, is really important. And it's great that you have an app for this, you know, for your bio and helps you with your diet and all that. Yeah, I, th I think it's the wave of the future. And where I'm looking at and, and what I designed in my whole body prosthetic, which is, is going to be upgraded in the, um, the, I'm calling it a new human, um, which will be my body and genetically engineered, um, not only with um, you know, biotech, but you know, nanomedicine and, and uh, prosthetic parts and everything, looking at the direction we can go in protecting the, the vulnerability of our biological body. I think that's, that's crucial, um, very crucial, because we can do everything possible, but if that virus comes and we're weak, so how do we deal with that? I mean, that's the bottom line, isn't it? This is, we find ourselves with this, this issue that all of a sudden everyone's had a wake-up call. We're biological animals and we are prone to disease. And while it's the disease of aging that needs so desperately to be recognized uh, by every medical institution, it's also the vulnerability of our body that maybe we do need to evolve beyond strict biology. Maybe we do need to have um, some type of security system in our body that identifies these viruses and other elements when they come about. I mean, you, know, you think about your computer and you have malware and then you have, you know, your, your computer gets scanned frequently. Mine does several times a day to check for any uh, flushing to check for any virus, to check for any websites I've gone to that may have been, um, you know, stuck something on me, uh, <laughs> on my computer, I should say, but it's with ourselves as well. I mean, you know, we're walking around like going, who has COVID-19? You no, know, where do we go? We can't see it. And it's that invisibility that is frightening. We can't smell it. We can't see it. We can't feel it until we get it or don't get it. And um, so, I think that we're going to have to really take a, a, a second look at our biology. And while, again, biotechnology and genetic engineering, all these great um, advances and therapies, stem cell therapy, are great, there's something bigger than that. And that something bigger than that is those are um, cures. They're preventative in, in large degree. I've been doing preventative um, DIY genetic engineering for years, especially with my bone density. I um, realized I was having bone loss, so I went out and I worked at finding solutions to that deficiency. And the result was, of course, vitamin D and um, exercise and taking whatever nutrients and uh, protocols I could to help build up my muscle mass and bone mass. Um, with, you know, if you start having memory loss and you need to exercise your brain and, and build that elasticity. Um, if you have joint pain, you need to stretch and move it and know what elements to take. But when we start getting into extreme genetic engineering of our bodies, the, the people who need it most are the, you know, the children that are born with Tay-Sachs and sickle cell anemia and, you know, various horrid diseases. 
Um, there's many uh, DIY um, biohackers out there who are experimenting with their bodies, and, and some of them are doing it in, in ways that um, are smart, and some that are doing it in ways that um, are dangerous. So we need to also think about that. And um, one size does not fit all. And to doing everything we can to mitigate aging means going to your doctor and looking at your blood work and seeing what needs to be done unless and until we can go in there and tweak and engineer the bad stuff out, put in more good stuff, and that then we get to the core issue here, which is transhumanism, or the transhumanist agenda is to realize that as human animals, we have a condition. The condition is a limited lifespan or shelf life, a frail biological body, and a um, unnecessary but innate characteristic of our brain stem, our reptilian brain, which is fight or flight, and a propensity for sadness. And those things are ingrained in all of us. And we're continuing having to, to mitigate that on a daily basis. But we brush our teeth on a daily basis. <laughs> you know? So why not focus on this on a daily basis and do our best to mitigate it? So I'm all for DIY stuff and biohacking, uh, as long as it's done um, in a way that um, is smart, but also documented. I remember when, for my scientific breakthrough, I was so delighted and I had to prove it over and over and over again. I had to work with hundreds and hundreds of these small, simple animals to prove that the theory that I had worked on with my team was sensible and we had to redo it over and over again, testing new chemicals, testing new methodologies, et cetera, until we found the methodology and the, and the, the chemical protocol that was most effective and safe. And then we had to test over and over for months and we had to document it on film, you know, had a, a video camera on the microscope, um, testing all our assays, recording it, recording it, and then finally writing and publishing the paper. And the paper was published in, you mentioned Aubrey de Grey, yeah, Aubrey's a dear friend and so on, I've known for many years, published it in his journal, um, and it was blind peer reviewed, and it was hard work to keep on going back to the drawing board and rewriting the paper based on um, the, the criticism about where my where the paper didn't evidence this and that, but we had all the evidence, it was proven, all that was good. But there's one thing in doing a scientific research and attempting to have a breakthrough, make a difference in the world, and then documenting it. And it's not easy to document. I thought writing a PhD um, doctorate dissertation was tough. Writing a scientific paper was, was really tough. And um, but I did it and I got through it and it's published. It's you know, you can find it on the government's um, medical website and of course in Aubrey's journal. But the point being that there are so many different protocols, so many different avenues. We're almost overwhelmed and flooded with oh, this new technology, this new therapy, this new way, and it's just like, and we're aging as we're trying to figure it all out. I think that having that. Going to reliable sources is, is so important. And as an academic and someone who's taught ethics and innovation, I, it's, it, it's ingrained in my thinking. I, I can't get around it. But there's the other side of me that's the creative free spirit, the former artist who says, go beyond, you know, go off the edge of that canvas and seek. But even there, even there, if you don't have the talent, you'll fall flat. And then it's every artist has, a, has an opportunity to show his or her or their talent. And if they can't carry a tune, we know they can't sing. It's the same thing in science, that you could have a great idea and have all the money in the world, have Jim Mellon financing you. Unless you come up with the breakthrough and document it and it's proven, then it's not science. And... Um, is that good or bad? I don't know. And then we take a look at where we are with the COVID-19 and, and new possible therapies for it. Like this, I can't remember the name of it, that, um, that chemical that's being- Hydroxychloroquine. Thank you, thank you. Um, 
maybe it works in some people, but maybe it doesn't work in other people. Maybe some people, their body can take it and it, it will cure them from COVID-19. Maybe someone else is going to destroy their liver. So you just It's back know. to personalized medicine that you already talked about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what you subscribe to. Um, it's, it's important. So then how do we do that? Well, we have to convince our doctors. And, you know, I've had to do that recently with, you know, two surgeries I've had. And I've had to really work very hard at um, putting together my own medical team to help me in the different stages of my recovery. Um, because the one doctor, my key doctor, didn't know anything about dermatology when I developed an allergic rash to the medication. <laughs> and so it's, it's up to each one of us. And I think going back to the online education and learning and relearning, uh, sorry, I came up too close. I think that going back to education and online learning and lifelong learning, that being given the reliable sources is what is needed today because there are so many sites that will sell you toothpaste with stem cell in it and you think that you're going to grow new teeth mm -mm, not so definitely uh credibility is very very important here and i appreciate you bringing that up uh, i do want to just briefly mention that i'm the co-founder of lev sciences so it stands for longevity escape velocity and my co-founder is Vladimir Trofanov. He is my IT wizard. He's got a team of about 30 coders who helps us build. And we're trying to build uh, certain databases and businesses and services that you, you know, have talked about. It's not easy. We're in the early stages of this, mm. but we're, you know, I, I interviewed Ben Gortzel a couple of weeks ago and we've had meetings with him and his team at Singularity Net and I've uh, interviewed Aubrey de Grey a couple of weeks ago for Lifespan Dio and Leaf, and hope that hopefully he can consult. And I'm I'm keeping Keith uh, Comito involved as well too, the founder and president of Lifespan Dio is Leaf and Leaf, and um, looking for his guidance as well, and and many other thought leaders. And so essentially, what we want to do is we want people to get all these longevity treatments that are showing efficacy. You know, things like um, metformin for example a lot of people are taking it but we want them to get tested with biomarkers before and then get retested after because that's what science is you know we want to actually see how much of an impact certain things are having on certain people and then if mm -hmm. you're taking like metformin and rapamycin and quercetin for example and you've done nad plus infusions and you've had stem cells We'd love to have, you know, a DNA methylation clock, the Steve Horvath clock we talked about before, and maybe telomere lengths and, and all the biomarkers possible tested beforehand and after. And we'd like to basically build that database. Obviously, it's yeah. a huge undertaking, but the point is, is that I want to be involved and help creating this in some capacity because this is really important work for the longevity rejuvenation movement. I think that it sounds absolutely fantastic. I love it. I, I, I really important, very much needed. And um, it, you know, it's interesting when you were mentioning that I had spoken to my general practitioner, uh, practitioner about metaphorum and he looked at me and said, you don't need it. Why, why would you be taking something you don't need? And I said, because in the life extension community, it's suggested and so there is the issue of getting our medical doctors on board, but also not to take things we don't need, because if you take something you don't need, it could backfire. Yes. We've already discussed the microbiome. Uh, Dr. Eric Berg is a chiropractor, but he's become a very prominent YouTuber. I believe his YouTube channel has over 2 million subscribers, maybe 3 million nowadays. I watch a lot of his videos. I think they're very well produced, very scientific. And I saw a video recently where he talked about um, evidence that metformin may be negatively impacting the microbiome. And so I saw that and I thought, oh man, but you know, the metformin, you know, for people who've been taking it now for decades who did have type two diabetes, they dramatically, you know, improved their lifespan and health span because it protected them from developing other conditions and problems that most people with type two diabetes have. 
So in other words, it's murky water still here in 2020 with all these things. We need way more data. We need way more data on specific things. And I hope to be a part of building these uh, databases and technologies with, with like-minded people. So another thing, uh, Natasha, that you mentioned earlier is about your uh, hair test. Now, I've done a couple hair mineral analysis tests. I did one in 2009 and 2013, and I want to do another one too. They're, they're cheap now. They're under $100. Is that what you were referring to, where it tells you like your levels of boron and iron and you know magnesium, things like that, or was it something different? I think it's something different. This was sent to a lab in Germany, and it just um, it, it sent out a whole um, chart on uh, where the stress in your body is, whether it's you know in your um, um, muscular skeletal system, in your cognitive emotional system, you know what it looked at. I can certainly um, uh, get that information and send it to you, but it's it was extremely comprehensive, and um, I've had my hair analysis done in the past many years ago because um, I was working with inks and dyes, and I got aluminum poisoning. So um, it's not just a follicle, it's at the root of the follicle. It's not just like cutting a piece of hair, it goes down to the very base of the hair. Okay. Um, and the labs in Germany, I don't know the name of the lab right offhand, but I can certainly send that to you because I think it's pretty interesting. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, just to be clear, what I had done in 20, 2009 and 2013 is, I just took a snippet of the back of my hair. They need a certain length, but they definitely didn't get the root. So that's yeah, this is the root and the, and the labs in Germany. Yeah, okay. so it's, yeah. Very interesting. Okay, so Natasha, I'd love to finish up with talking about certain technologies and rejuvenation technologies, singularity, 2045, stuff like that where you see this movement going. We've talked a lot about your history. You know, we've talked a lot about the state of the situation right now, uh, where the science is. Where do you see all of this going with the rejuvenation field and technology in general? And <sighs> it's a very vague, open question for you to answer however you prefer. Well, I, I think where I see it going is certainly not something that is happenstance. You know, it's not the 100 monkey theory. Um, I think that it needs um, a focused direction. And I think that focused direction is on uh, several different areas. I think that as far as medical technology is concerned, the focused direction must be on aging as a disease. Everything else is secondary. Mm -hmm. So once it's established that aging is a disease, that humans do not have to age so rapidly, I, uh, I think that would be the, the salvo or the, the motto. Along with that, I think it's very important to get the message out that trying to be young forever is not, is not the reason. How you can be youthful at any age, you just don't want to be crippled at that age. So um, as far as arthritis, that's a very serious disease and rheumatoid arthritis as well. For people who are aging, that's part of aging, your joints weaken, they become swollen, it hurts. It hurts to use your hands to lift something. I have arthritis in my right hand. And I've been to numerous doctors, one who wanted to give me stem cells. And uh, of course he had his own lab clinic around the corner and I said, no. Um, so. That's you know, something that we can talk about another day, but make sure that your doctors who are offering you therapies are not the ones who are, who are you know, have the company building those therapies, because they're doctors, that's what they're supposed to do. Therapies, separate. Um, so um, I exercise my hand, I work through it, and it's, it's gone away, but arthritis is something that comes and goes, so you have to be very careful about that. That's part of aging. Another part of aging is you know, the pains and the aches along your body, harder to get up and get down. That's what we want to ameliorate. Um, slow thinking, uh, any type of dementia, which is part of aging. That's something we wanna slow down and prevent as much as possible. So I think the message there is not that people wanna be 20. I would never wanna be 20 again. I don't, I don't, 
I loved I loved my 40s and 50s and even 60s. So it's it's the um, just want to continue to mature or grow in our wisdom and our experiential uh, life, but not with all the the drawbacks of pain and and um, diminished ability to exercise and dance, for example. So I think that's the strongest message, aging as a disease, but not that we're trying to be, um, this is the criticism I've had going back to the 1980s, that, oh, you just wanna stay young forever. You just wanna be you know, young and beautiful in your 20s. I said, no, that has nothing to do with it. It's about vitality. Okay. The second message that's very important is to see beyond political parties. That yes, I agree with you that politics are part of life. We have governance, we have laws, we have legislations and policies. And it is very important for those of us in longevity, no matter what field you're in or what domain you're in, um, to, to be sure that we get policies um, to our legislators, to our Congress and Senate, and anyone who has, who um, writes up bills and gets bills passed and um, sets the laws and regulations, that they understand that the populace sees um, aging as a disease and that that must be cured. So it takes a lot of hard work in politics. I think we need to get away from party lines. And I think it's very important within the transhumanist um, agenda to be as diverse as possible. And the caveat there is diverse as possible without hegemony, without coercion. You can be left, right, up or down, it doesn't matter as long as the message is in support of the true values of transhumanism, which is to overcome the human condition, which ties us back into longevity and uh, the disease of aging. So that's very important. I, so the message there is let's not just say one, you know, the USTP versus the techno progressives or the libertarians versus the socialists. That is very 20th century, 19th century. It's very archaic. It has no place in the future of transhumanism. We need to focus on the issues and do what's best within the countries that are governed and every country is governed differently. For example, in Sweden, you'd say Sweden is a socialist country. No, Sweden has free markets. It's not 100% socialist. It does have competition in free markets and capitalism. So I think we need to understand this um, more clearly than, than we do today. Um, so I spoke about longevity and health and medicine and politics, now society. We need to invest more in our social understanding and our respectfulness as a society that has numerous different cultures around the world that differ. So the takeaway there is uh, respect, of course, but multiplicity and diversity to allow different cultures to behave the way they behave as long as they don't coerce anyone else, as long as they don't push their views on anyone else. That's freedom of choice. Freedom of body is the next one, morphological freedom, the right to be able to augment, enhance, and upgrade your body, including your brain, and the right to never be coerced to upgrade, enhance, augment your body or your brain. Very important. The, um, the area um, in society as well is looking across generations to understand that we need to nurture our children to be sure, but we also need to nurture our I don't want to say senior citizens. I want to get away from that. Um, the elderly, the people. A rejuvenation the generation. That's yeah, what you yeah, call we it. Yeah, we need to I like nurture the rejuvenative generation and keep them vital, keep them hired, keep them working, um, engage them. I would like to see designers, as I mentioned before, Tom Ford or Donatello or Donna Karen or whoever, come up with new styles for people. And as far as the technology that we're using today, we need to make sure that it's it's usable. And this is a human computer interaction and something that's um, very important in that area is that the technology needs to be uh, available to everyone, not just people who are flexible with their fingers that can text, that there are people who need to use these technologies, these smart devices and these apps such as the apps that you're using, 
but may not have the agility and the fingers to use them. So we need better designs for the technologies that we're using. So that is medical, a political, social, economics is the other area that our economy is, has faced a very, uh, an onslaught of vulnerabilities and we're handicapped with it. So we need some smart people to get in there and figure out how we're gonna get out of this mess that we're in. It's not me, I'm not an economist, um, but I think we do need to have economists work uh, with us to take a look at this. So that socio-political economic views that I have. And the last one I'm going to say is on um, personal responsibility. There are a number of people in the world that may be less than kind, that use social media to damage other people, who will use um, hegemony or make themselves more important than someone else. And I think that we need to get beyond that. Um, Andy Warhol said that everyone will have their five minutes of fame. Well, it's now 20 seconds of fame or five seconds of fame. I think we need to all grow up and get out of this selfie sensibility of uh, look at me here, look at me there. I, I'm, I'm a bit worn out by it. And I'm sure most people are. And at least that's what I'm hearing in, in, in the back rooms of most organizations. Enough is enough. Let's just all get back to work and, and do what we can do. And lastly, there's room for everyone. Each of us has unique talents and skills and experiences. So let's stop thinking about celebrities or who's the most famous or who has the most tweets or who's recognized the most. There is room for everyone. And when I hear people saying, oh, you know, this person is the most recognized or had the best at this, that is to me a negative. I'd rather be someone who contributes, not the best or the most, because there is no best, there is no most, and there is no absolute. Very, I'll, I'll beautiful. End on that. Very beautifully stated. Um, that's fantastic. And I just want people to really think about all the things you stated there. There's a word that I repeat a lot on my YouTube channel, which is voluntarism. And I think that's kind of what you were describing, right? And uh, Yeah, I just put on my glasses so now I can see. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I, I think that we need to stop saying, oh, I'm the best and I'm the most, or I'm the only person in the world, or, you know, we're, every one of us has something unique. Each one of us has a story. And we could say each one of us, meaning everyone, is the best or the only, or the most unique, because each one of us has a different story. So let's let other people say that about us rather than that saying that about ourselves. And I, I, I think that's something I learned from my mother, who is an honorable, lovely, brilliant woman who um, volunteered for most of her life, helping other people. And um, so if we, even if we do accomplish something, or each one of us, someone accomplishes something that's incredible, let other people say that about you. Very, Give them very the opportunity. Nice. That, yes, definitely. Those are very powerful ideas that I want the audience to consider. Um, so Natasha, you've been very gracious with your time. And where can people get a hold of you or get in touch with you if they want to? I'm really easy to find. Okay. <laughs> um, just if you just Google Natasha Vita hyphen more, you'll find me. My website is natashavitamore.com. I have a YouTube channel that's that's been on hold um, because I while everyone else was doing social media and self-promotion, I decided to go the other direction and not do it. So, um, but I'm going to be coming out of the, the uh, background into the foreground now that I have some um, new ideas I want to share. Um, but just, you know, Google me. I'm, I'm available. You can email me. Um, uh, I work with lots of students throughout the world, um, which is great. So many different universities are talking about transhumanism. It's starting to become coursework and longevity along with that. So I think that if we take transhumanism and tie it into a new humanism 
and that's one of my next projects as well. I want to see the future of transhumanism and get beyond some of the, the divides that have erupted over the past few years and get back to a more unified sensibility about longevity. And that is something I'm going to be volunteering a lot of my time towards. And um, I don't want to um, say that, that it's, it's not anti anything, it's, it's more inclusive of everything and looking at a new humanism. And um, whether you want to call that transhumanism or not, but I think we need to um, somehow steer away from um, some of the negativity around transhumanism that has been prop propagated and look for um, a healthier, kinder, more compassionate worldview that focuses on longevity and overcoming the human condition. And I think that's real important and not man remaining man, humans overcoming, humans evolving. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Natasha, for your time. Thank and you. I want to give you the last word if there's any final things. It sounds like that was a final, but this is unrehearsed. So is there any uh, final finals or are we, is that how you want to end it? I guess if I had a, a final final, let's say onward towards a new humanism that seeks beyond transhumanism towards a more inclusive, diverse, healthy longevity for humanity. Something like that, I suppose, or maybe the other one was better. I don't know. I'll let you all decide. Okay. Whichever Perfect. way I, I, I sound better. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Natasha. We uh, sincerely appreciate your time and your wisdom and your knowledge and all the stories that you've shared with us. And it's Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. Thank you. I want to be forever young